And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Recode Senior Editors, Jason Del Rey and Kurt Wagner. Hello. Did we eat? Did we have good lunch? Thumbs up? Thumbs up, I see a couple. Yes? Okay, lie to me. Tell me, tell me it was great. Good. Um, this is Kurt Wagner, my colleague at Hello. Recode, and we have a really exciting lineup for the rest of the day, starting with uh, an interview that both of us are very excited about. Uh, we have NBA Commissioner Adam Silver and also Michael Rubin, who's the executive chairman of Fanatics. And you know, a couple years ago, the NBA opened a new flagship store in New York City, and they didn't turn to an old school retailer to operate that store. They didn't turn to you know, one of the big old school apparel brands, they turned to a company called Fanatics, which is part e-commerce, part manufacturing, we'll, we'll jump into all that. And then this year, starting this year, uh, they're also relying on Fanatics to manufacture and sell the NBA's replica jerseys, which are the team jerseys that are most affordable, somewhere around 60 or $70. Um, and so there's a really interesting dynamic going on right now between Fanatics, the NBA, and other sports leagues that we wanted to dive into today, as well as a lot of other uh, newsy topics with uh, NBA. So uh, with that said, let's, let's have Adam and Michael join the stage, please. And you're going to sit there. I'll shake your hand. Good to see you. Michael, right here. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to talk all sports. I like it. You like it. So Michael's also a co-owner of the Philadelphia 76ers and the New Jersey Devils? I am. OK, so I'm going to, for a little while, ignore my New York Knicks bias, which, and. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. We um, hope they're ignored in general, but. So let's, let's, let's start sort of at uh, something that's pretty newsy, which is NBA jer replica jerseys this year are being made and sold by Fanatics. And you know, for some people in the room who might not know Fanatics super well, like how does, how does that happen? We think Nike, we think Adidas, and Nike has a relationship with the Encore jerseys. But how does a deal like this happen? You, you know, from our perspective, I think, and Adam, keep me honest, I think leagues in general really want to build their direct-to-consumer businesses. So whether it's ticketing, whether it's media, E-commerce and retail is really no different. So um, the NBA has been very innovative, and I think in general, we've built a massive um, sports direct-to-consumer e-commerce business. And um, what leagues are looking to do today is, is to help really enable that and grow that while best satisfying fans. So the NBA replica jersey is an item, it's one of the most popular items in the NBA that we were able to dedicate to that business and really use it to help best service fans. So a great example would be Kyrie Irving gets traded into the Celtics, and in the old days it would take weeks to get those jerseys to retail. Now in hours, because we're completely vertical, we can best service fans. So you know, I think it's part of the, the league's desire to build big direct-to-consumer businesses and do it in a way that's best for fans and also everybody involved. You know, I'll just add uh, to Michael's credit, um, he figured this out decades ago. I mean, we, we've been in essence in business together for 20 years. And, Michael had a vision as to where this business is going, and I think if Nike and Adidas were sitting here, they would acknowledge that they couldn't do what he's doing even if they wanted to. So Nike, beginning this year, they have our on-court apparel rights for our uniforms. But when it comes to the replica jersey, they don't have the infrastructure in place to deliver overnight to, as, as Michael said, when you have 450 players in the league, you have demand for D different levels of demand for different players depending on their popularity. Players are moving from team to team. Fanatics is in a position to service those fans literally overnight. Trade happens, they're up, the product's available, that's, you know, they're the entire chain of delivery from manufacturing to the interface to consumer to the actual delivery. And they are, there's a reason that Fanatics, they may not be as well known as a consumer brand right now, but and this is not a sports industry conference, but at a sports industry conference, Fanatics is known to everyone because they're, in essence, they are the sole factor for all the leagues. They, and there was a decision by the league some number of years ago, largely because of the confidence we have in Michael, that this isn't a business we should go in. He offers, the other thing that Michael figured out was that it was gonna be a business of scale. 
And I think we, we've known each other for 20 years, but we haven't been in business for 20 years because he was very persistent. And he kept coming back to the league as we, at one point, there, we had a deal with Foot Locker, we had a deal with, directly with Amazon in the old days, and Michael kept saying, you're gonna end up in business with me sooner or later because I have the scale, I have the expertise in the sports, in the sports industry, and that's what he's done. He, he owns this marketplace in the sports industry, and all of us use him. So let's, for people who aren't super familiar sure. with Fanatics as either consumer brand or B2B brand, yeah. can you just explain the different parts of the business, and, and I know there's many now, but you're verticalizing. Sure. Yeah. So Fanatics is the largest retail in the world of licensed sports merchandise. What started originally as only an e-commerce business is really becoming the largest brand of e of, of really licensed sports merchandise online. So you go out and sign yeah, big yeah. licensing deals. Yeah, we, we pay, you know, we, you know, Fanatics this year will be over $2 billion in revenue. I think when we started in business um, 15 years ago, we started with about $10 million in business. So we've gone from $10 million to over $2 billion, focused 100% on selling licensed sports merchandise. 75% of that is direct to consumer via either e-commerce or operating the venues. And then the balance of that goes through wholesale to retailers that are still an important part of the ecosystem. And I think what's a little bit different about Fanatics is you've got these really incredibly successful e-commerce companies like Amazon and Alibaba. I didn't have to bring yeah, up yeah, the A, the a name, you know, huh? no, we, we, we all live in the world. And, and I think you've got these incredibly successful companies and really what they are is gigantic marketplaces selling other people's brands. You know, they're gonna do a trillion dollars combined. And so they're really successful businesses, but they're actually in a lot of ways not great for brands because they don't have a great brand presentation. In a lot of ways you can have kind of a flea market experience, but they're massively successful companies. And so what Fanatics is, is really the first, what I'd say is large scale v-commerce, or really what means verticalized commerce company, where what we do is we design, develop, and sell directly to consumers the products we make. So kind of think about like H&M or Zara or Uniqlo kind of in the modern online version, much more online driven and much less kind of store focused. How does it work, how does it work internationally with you guys? So obviously with the NBA, China is a huge market for you. So when you're going out and, and giving these licensing deals out for apparel, how much are you thinking, okay, you know, how is spread out is it? Like, are you able to sell in China? Do you have to go to someone else who's a distributor specifically there? How does that work? Yeah, so, so our business started very much as a North American business. And we went from, you know, a startup business to, you know, close to $2 billion focused very much on North America. Now international has become a massive business for us. We operate the entire NBA Europe direct-to-consumer business. We operate the NHL, Major League Baseball. We have um, many of the largest soccer teams, Manchester United, Real Madrid, Everton. Um, so, you know, big focus on global for us. But the way the business works is you go and you kind of buy the rights to run that business and then you kind of build it globally. We think for us, that we have a massive opportunity ahead of us. Today, the business, again, about $2 billion. We think this could be you know, a $10 billion business long term and that international will be a huge portion of that. And again, that's gonna be from not only the US leagues with a big opportunity international, but also uh, with, with the relevant sports in each country, certainly soccer being the biggest part of that. And, and it's, the same, it's the same model for us outside of the United States in that we have a global relationship with Nike. So again, they have our on-court apparel rights and that brand is being projected everywhere that our games are, are broadcast or streamed. But then, as I said, Nike is not in the business that Michael's in, but he's complementary to Nike. So when we do that Nike deal, they understand that we're then gonna go to Fanatics in terms of replica jerseys. To the extent he's in business in Europe, obviously in the United States, and then in other territories where he doesn't exist yet, we'll find other factors. But it's not, you know, and we as, and I know I speak for all the leagues, we, we promote, we even invest in Michael to enable him to then move into those other territories because we need him to exist there because we recognize as a league. And that's where I think we had some false starts early on where, you know, we thought maybe we could do this ourselves, but then you quickly realize if you don't have the scale, if you really are trying to do it with one brand, it's not gonna make sense on a global basis. So the, the piece of, um, you're talking about becoming verticalized and controlling you know, manufa manufacturing, sales, you know, delivery and all that. The piece I don't understand in sports licensing is why it matters, uh, does the Fanatics brand matter to consumer of sports apparel? So like what I care about sure. is, is Porzingis on the back of the jersey and is James Dolan still yeah. the owner of the Knicks? But, yeah. um, well, I can only help you on the first part. Yeah. Um, so I think humbly we'd say 
and I think Nike and Adidas and Under Armour would say the same thing. In the sports license business, fans are buying the merchandise because of the team and because of the player, first and foremost. And that's what drives most of the business from a licensed sports perspective. Um, and, and I think we recognize that. And for us, we, have, we work with the best uh, intellectual property in the world. Something that's really interesting is just 10 years ago, uh, the league's direct-to-consumer businesses in merchandise might have been 1% or 2% of their business. Today, it's 20% plus is through their own direct-to-consumer business. So I, I'd say collectively today, the leagues have one of the most successful direct-to-consumer businesses of any brands in the world, and so many other industries and so many other companies aspire to have the kind of market share online that the leagues are doing in their partnership with us today. Got and it. so you're managing the brick and mortar, the retail store, the official NBA store, right? Um, but it sounds like obviously a ton of your business is online. Can you give us a sense of that ratio? Or sure. like, is, are there going to be more brick and mortar stores or is most everything gonna be sold online? Yeah, so, so the part of brick and mortar that we're really focused on is operating the retail businesses of the leagues and the team's official stores. So we operate um, several individual NBA teams, we operate the official NBA store, we operate um, um, stores in every single sport. And for us, what we do is we really listen to the fan. We really listen to um, the owners and, and, and our, the leagues and our partners about what they want. And what we heard consistently was that they want a fan to be able to go online, buy it online, pick it up at the venue. They want to be able to beat the venue, buy it online, have it delivered to the seat, or have it shipped to their house. Is, that, st is that stuff happening today? That's, is that stuff is some of that started to happen, and all of that will happen in the next couple of years. Think about using all of the inventory in the venues for local delivery. We could be doing, in a decade from now, a billion dollars in local de delivery same day via Uber. To that, today, it's barely relevant. So the point is, the venues become a very important part of the ecosystem. To the question you asked, what I feel very fortunate about is we, you know, our foundation is, is that of an e-commerce company. So 75% of our revenue today comes from e-commerce. And that's why we're so lucky. Because many retailers today, you can take great vertical brands, but they have these stores that are becoming less efficient every year. For us, 75% of our revenue is in e-commerce. And so if you have an unfortunate circumstance, like the sports authority goes out of business, more of the customers go to the NBA store, go to the individual venues to buy that merchandise. So we're kind of in all support parts of the ecosystem. Adam, uh, you were talking about sort of the reach and scale of some, you know, a company like Fanatics. And when, when I hear those words and I think e-commerce, I think Amazon, of course, in a lot of ways. So I'm curious when, you know, for the mass appeal that the NBA has, um, is, is a company like, are, are there reasons why Amazon is not attractive in sort of this type of relationship? Well, it, it's not that Amazon isn't attractive. I, I think we had a deal years ago with Amazon when they, in essence, were trying to become fanatics. And they ultimately decided that was not a business they wanted to be in. I, I think they, you know, they were, they were going to develop business where they, were, they had designers, they were developing product, and I think they obviously know what they, they're good at very well, and they decided that didn't make sense. But for, from the NBA standpoint, we're very much in business with Amazon. Um, Michael's entering into a relationship with Fanatics with Amazon where if you go to Amazon, which m most people do, and Michael didn't answer your question directly about the Fanatics brand, but if so, if you're thinking Amazon as a place to go to get that Porzingis jersey, you're going to be led to Fanatics. And so through, in, in essence, we exist as part of that, uh, of that l larger ecosystem. So it, Amazon is very important to us from that standpoint, and then completely independent of their e-commerce business, as Amazon is increasingly going into the programming business, and whether it's through Twitch, and we're in the process of lo launching an, an eSports league, or even through Amazon Prime, and they're looking not yet at, you know, well, I should say, they're now looking at live sports programming, they have a relationship with the NFL, but they're looking at other sports-related documentaries and other things, that's becoming an important relationship with us for, with Amazon as well. So Amazon is, is very much part of our business. And, and I don't think in any way having this relationship with Fanatics is inconsistent with that. I'd probably add on, too. I think, again, going back to the original theme that leagues and teams in general want to build their direct-to-consumer businesses, it's no different for any brand, whether you said Nike or Ralph Lauren or Under Armour or Adidas or pick any great brand. Everyone's very focused on building their direct-to-consumer business because they can have that relationship di directly with the consumer and interact in a much better way. So I think, you know, if you're a sports league today and you can build, you know, 
10 years ago, you had 1% of your business going through direct to consumer. You say it's 20% of the business, and you do it in a brand right way where you control the presentation, you get all that customer data, using that data to drive every different business that you have, whether it's MBA League Pass, whether it's MBA ticketing, whether it's giving it to the clubs to use to, to uh, you know, interact directly with their fans. It's an incredible opportunity. So, you know, again, we look at Amazon and have a huge respect and admiration for the company. At the same time, we also look and say, from a brand presentation perspective, I don't know that it's the, you know, the place that we say they present the merchandise in the way that's you know, the most brand right way for, for, you know, for us and our brands. Uh, Michael, you kind of mentioned it briefly, uh, the like in arena interaction. Um, I know in the NFL, for example, Levi Stadium in Silicon Valley, order a jersey, they'll deliver it right to your seat. And that's a fanatic stadium. Is okay, so, so how widespread is that? How important is it to like make that in arena experience kind of that on demand? Like, is that a key point, a part of getting people uh, in the seats? These I, th days? I think it's really important to take every part of the live experience and make it great. And from the merchandise perspective, I think generally speaking, it had been pretty poor. So we saw it as a massive opportunity to take, you know, kind of the entire kind of in venue experience and really take it to a very modern omni-channel best of class experience. Let's give the best possible customer experience you can by giving the consumer or the fan the chance to buy any way they want. And so we think ultimately um, you know, having every venue globally is important for us because we can best service the fan, um, the leagues, the teams, and kind of all of our constituencies. And those are separate agreements, so the, the in-arena agreements come there, separate? You go team by team, and that's why you know, a couple years ago we had none, and today we have about 40. Okay, that sounds like an expect, expensive undertaking. It's certainly, you know, certainly leagues, and I'm, um, you know, both sides of it, both from a Sixers perspective and yeah, from, you're a, like, from, you, from, from a Fanatics perspective, yeah. but leagues are very good at properly, you know, getting the right value for their rights. So from one sense, you're doing one big deal. From the other sense, they're very good at monetizing these. The teams are individual partnerships one at a time that you do. Speaking of expensive, you, uh, you recently, I believe, closed a billion dollar investment led by SoftBank with some, some of the leagues involved as well. What do you need that much money? Well, you know, for, for us, again, it goes back to when we separated and, 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 you know, when I bought this business back from eBay in 2011, in 2010, we were a $250 million company. Today, we're over a $2 billion company. We think this could be a $10 billion business globally to build out all the infrastructure, to globalize the business, to buy rights at a rapid pace, to keep adding capabilities. It takes capital, and certainly SoftBank, for me, was a great place to partner because they were my first investor in my old company in 1999. So a lot of people don't know the story that Masayoshi son and Ron Fisher put $100 million into GSI Commerce in 1999. Which was a previous company of yours. Yeah, my previous company, eBay, bought it for $2.5 billion in 2011. So when they started the, the Vision Fund, we looked at them as kind of one of the best possible partners that we could have to really uh, accelerate the growth of the business. Got it. Um, did, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, well, I was going to change gears. Just Let's do it. Adam had mentioned, you mentioned Amazon. You mentioned live sports. Um, Amazon's working with the NFL this year. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, everyone wants to stream live sports. You guys have your rights locked up for TV for quite a while, but I'm curious if, if Amazon or someone came to you tomorrow and said, hey, we really want to stream 20 NBA games next year. Uh, what, what do you have available? Is that something you can well, even do? Well, let me just begin by saying, so when you say our rights are locked up for a while, I think you're largely referring to our domestic rights. So okay. obviously with, with um, Disney, ESPN, ABC, and, and Time Warner, soon to be AT&T and TNT in, in the US, but our games are of distributed in 215 countries and territories. So we have a lot of opportunity outside the United States. Our rights are somewhat limited in the, in the US right now, and that makes sense because what Disney and Time Warner are buying for us is in large part exclusivity. And they have, you know, Disney's recent announcement, they have their own plans to stream directly to consumers. There are things around the edges we can do with those services in the US. Certainly we can do non-game programming. We have something that we call League Pass, which is out of market games. So if you're a Knicks fan and you're not in the New York territory, if you're in Chicago, you can buy a package of every Knicks game, for example. You can buy a season package. You can buy individual games. Warriors fan in New York, same thing. So those are things that we can work with all those various services mm -hmm. on. Outside the United States, however, take Facebook, for example. 
we streamed a package of games in India with yeah. Facebook last year. And what was so interesting to me about, and, and, I, and I'm really excited about the conversations that are going on right now at Facebook, at Amazon, some of the recent announcement, they're not just streaming the NFL feed the way it appears on television, but trying new things. And I think they're just scratching the surface. What, what I think will happen over the next several years, and these discussions are going on now, when you think about the way our games are produced on ESPN, for example, it essentially looks the same way it did 30 years ago. I mean, high definitions made a huge difference, but if you look at the basic way the games are broadcast, there's sort of a mid-level play-by-play camera that follows back and forth. There are two end zone cameras. You can follow the action and a few other cameras, but it r looks pretty much the same way it always has. I think what, now if you think about, um, anybody here is a gamer, if you go on Twitch, for example, and see what it looks like to follow those competitions, um, it's sort of constant, chatter of fans. There's all kinds of other information appearing on the screen. Um, if, and I think, too, a lot of older consumers used to, used to looking at sports, it might look incredibly cluttered. But I think a, as Facebook and these other services experiment with live sports rights, and I'm sure Amazon's going to be doing the same thing, I think they don't have the same limitations that cable and satellite historically have had. If you think about the same way, it, really, it's not for lack of creativity from the great cable and satellite companies. It's a limitation of the technology and essentially the cable box. And what they can do over the top, on the other hand, is you can really have unlimited fields on your screen. You can have information popping on, coming off. You can have you know, descriptions of plays, more information about players. So what, what's most interesting to me, and, I, and, and I've seen a lot of the work that's now sort of the R&D work that's being done by these over the top services, is that I think our game not next year, but three, four, five years from now, it's going to start looking very different. And, and, and again, I think the way most people think of it now, because this is what's happened when you know, Facebook streamed our games or Twitter experimented with the NFL or now Amazon, it's still, in essence, you're, it's great. You're able to watch on your phone or your tablet or whatever the, that same beautiful HD feed you could watch on television. But it's pretty much the same thing. It's just more convenient. And I think what we're going to quickly see, and it's, and it's really positive from our standpoint, is a real competition among these services to figure out better ways to, product, to provide this programming to consumers. And it's going to mean that you almost think about it. You can have unlimited audio feeds, for example. You may not want to listen to the same you know, standard play-by-play -play that you always get. Instead. You re it could be your friend doing play-by-play. -play. It could be a comedian doing play-by-play. -play. It could be a celebrity doing play-by-play -play who happens to be sitting courtside. You can be getting you know, all kinds of different inf information about those players, where they're from. You know, it may be biometrics. It may be they're all like wearables is a hot area in sports right now. It may be fascinating to see you know, how much you know, try to measure stress levels of players when they go to, go to the more, line when they're in certain so situations. So sort of unlimited information. Un okay. Unlimited information, which I think, and then, then on top of that, there's sort of the new world of daily fantasy moving towards probably legalized gaming slash gambling, sports betting in, in this country. There's going to be all these new fields of information, which I think, in a way, when you look at our games right now, it's almost the equivalent of a silent movie. If you think of in the old days and that, you know, where you don't hear what they're saying to each other. You don't really, unless you're sitting courtside in an NBA game, where Michael sits, by the way, that, that the, you know, the, the goal really is that putting aside his success and his ability to sit courtside, it doesn't scale, obviously. You know, there's only so many courtside seats, so many NBA games. For that matter, there's so many seats, so many seats in so many NBA arenas. But what we always say is using that technology, if we can replicate that seat, if we could there, mention virtual reality, augmented reality, mm -hmm. if we can use all these different, different technology to change the experience. So someone at home, and home may be in Shanghai where you don't have access to an NBA arena, but you can replicate that experience, including buying jerseys, including sitting there in the same way you guys asked about a right. delivery, a jersey being delivered, in the same way now in, in an Amazon service in New York now where you can have delivery an hour later Presumably, you'll be sitting there, you'll want that jersey, and by the time the game's over, it'll appear at your apartment or home, and it'll be delivered. All of that is very possible now. Do you, as, as a co-owner of a team, do you, do you care about, how much do you care about where games are being shown? I know you have a great seat, but do you, you, know, do you think a lot about, or at all, about the pl you know, different platforms and over the top versus TV? Yeah. Or is the, I, I, the, the money green from wherever it comes? No, I, I, I think that um, most owners, um, you know, 
well, first and foremost, they count on the league to help you know push the sport forward. They really want to help push the sport forward as well, and I think everyone wants to think in the best interest of the fans. And there's no question that um, you know fans' way of absorbing content is changing dramatically. It's funny. I hear people talk all the time about, hey, TV ratings aren't what they used to be, but the fandom's never been better, and we see that in our business. And what's happening today is just you have fans consuming sports in a different way. So you could have TV that's down. 5% or 10%, but you have so many increases in so many other places. And what you need to think about is the overall fandom. So for us, um, the more that Adam and the league can do to build different vehicles and different mechanisms to distribute content is great for building the sport globally. Adam, let's assume you know Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all of those folks are here today and they say, okay, sounds like there's some international games that might be available. It sounds like maybe some out of market, even like NBA League Pass, am I reading that right? Like yes, they exactly. could go after something like that. Exactly. What's the pitch that's going to convince you to, to give 20 games to Facebook? I mean, is it simply writing a big enough check? Is it coming to you with all of these features that kind of you described? Like, what's going to be a good sales pitch for I, you? I think the best sales pitch to us, uh, you know, of course, money matters, but I think the real sales pitch that, that is going to carry the day, and it's beginning already, is how they're going to find new ways to engage our fans in these telecasts. Because as Michael Pine, you know, a function of the ratings, part of the reason ratings are down a little bit for, for a lot of the sports programming isn't that, to use an internet term, it's not that there are fewer unique people watching the broadcast, it's that the individuals are watching for less time. And ratings are just a function of average number of viewers per minute. And so, take the NBA, if the average viewer used to watch a two and a half hour game 50 minutes, but now because there's so many other options, is watching 45 minutes instead, you may have even slightly more unique viewers, but your rating is going to be down. And to me, the, the way to combat that is to create a more engaging telecast. And whether that's because people can participate in their fantasy leagues and they can follow individual players and their stats as they're watching the game, whether there's, there's, there's more focus on the interesting people who are attending the game because of the, you know, if you just think about going to an NBA game that often your attention is like, well, who are those celebrities sitting courtside and what are they about? Or you have, you have a better sense of what's happening on the floor, that there's audio that wasn't previously available. You know what the referee is saying to a player. You know what a player is saying to another player. Those are the things. I think our content's incredibly compelling. And I think, as I said, that there's, there's been a certain sameness in the business for a long time that really, I've been at the NBA for 25 years. And, and again, with the exception of high definition, which has made a huge difference, the games look exactly the same in terms of the fundamental way they've been broadcast. And I think what, what's happening now, as you see in any marketplace, and it's great, there's so much energy, especially out in Silicon Valley, behind now the programming business, and they're turning to sports and saying, how can we present sports, traditional sports, in a different way? Amazon's starting a little bit with the NFL through different audio feeds and, and, and different angles and, and streams available to consumers. But I think it, it's just beginning. And, I, and what also will come is interactivity. I think the same way now that often I'll watch programming on my iPad instead of a 70-inch beautiful television because it's easier to navigate on my iPad than it is through the traditional cable interface. You're and, not and, on Twitter at the same time? I thought that was and I, and I And by the way, and I am on Twitter at the same time because I'm also on my phone because I'm, I'm, I'm like any fan, when I'm watching an NBA game, you're sort of, you're getting it the way that ESPN or whoever chooses to present it, but there's this world of people who follow the league who may have a very different interpretation about what they're seeing on the floor, about you know, whether that was a smart move by the coach at that moment or why a player uh, came out of the game or whether that's a terrible strategy on, on, be, on behalf of a particular team. And so I can follow, the, let's say, 100 different people on Twitter, see what they're saying about the game. And it's almost hard for me now to watch a game without doing that at the same time. For whatever reason, Twitter in particular has become the place, the sort of the home of the, of the NBA. But it doesn't really make sense that that's a two-screen experience. Mm -hmm. And presumably, the, and, and that's very much, and, I, and I've sat in the room with all the services you've mentioned and, and talked to their development people about this. They're, they're laser-like focused on that, not just bidding against conventional linear television saying, can we pay a higher rights fee? But how can we present this in a new, different, and compelling way that will create more engagement on behalf of viewers? And you, meant, you mentioned Twitter and the NBA being big there. You know, Sixers account, uh, a lot of fun there. I mean, the from the teams to the players, really aggressive and out there 
on Twitter. And the players love it. I mean, yeah. They, they, and so for a while, you know, on the commerce side, for a while, I thought that might be one area where Twitter commerce could be a thing, or so the idea of social commerce could work. The my team just won, or so and so had a great game, and. Um, it hasn't really worked. What do you, what do you it, think that is? It, it actually is really starting to work in a big way. I'd say, I was just looking at the numbers in the last month or two. Paid social media has now become bigger for fanatics than PLAs. And that's a giant sea change. So if you look at kind of all product listing ads, which has been a, a huge part of the market. Google, exclu Google ads? or Including Google ads. So okay. Google PLAs, you now look at paid social media, it's bigger than Google product listing ads. So it's, that's really changed. I think it's up 10x for us. Over, and these are what, like ago. a jersey and a tweet? Yeah, well, or? Look, there's, there's so much data that you can use within social media to personalize the experience that it makes it incredibly easy for us to, to monetize that. And so for us, I think our players in general, athletes, celebrities are incredibly passionate about using social media media to communicate with their fans and I think um, good commerce companies are really learning how um, really learning how to monetize that it's no different than the you know 10 years ago we sat around and said will mobile commerce ever be important and now you know it's one gigantic business we don't even care where somebody buys whether it's desktop mobile app it doesn't even matter it's just it's one great and, overall and I'll just add, and, and, and I think part of the reason at least historically it hasn't caught on in the way it's only beginning to now is because fanatics didn't exist as I said the traditional sporting goods companies have not been in the hot market business. They're in the long lead time business. And hot market yeah. for people who don't know is. I mean, hot market meaning, you know, literally that something exciting happens, there's a new product, and, the, and Fanatics, it pops up on our site, it's available the next day. Golden State set a new record. You know, a pl particular player uh, um, set a, a, a new scoring record or whatever else. That's the hot market, that there's this something available, a jersey, a special edition jersey, it's now, it's, it's now available that night to order, delivered the next and day. He has the ability to do that, and almost no one else in the industry does. And there's always great things happening in sports, whether it's the lows, the highs, the, the great plays, the great moments, and so taking all that content, as Adam's talking about, and using that to drive our programming has been something that traditional retail just can't react to, and that's a big benefit for the leagues to build this direct-to-consumer business with their fans and be able to help best service their fans. We're gonna open it up to Q&A in just a minute. I have one more question, Adam. Um, I think it was in the last week, uh, yourself and the head of the Players Union, um, you know, you talk about players being super active on Twitter. Uh, you, you both wrote a letter to the players that was essentially, I'll let you explain it, but I think essentially um, encouraging players to sp speak their minds on social issues and, uh, and in their communities. And NBA players in general have been seem like much more vocal and their teams being much more accepting of them taking sort of social stances on what's going on in the world, in the country that matter to them. Um, what, why did you feel the need for that? Well, it, so Michelle Roberts, who's head of our Players Association and I, felt the need to send that letter to players, not just to remind them that they should feel free to speak their minds, which is absolutely fine, and, and almost ensuring them that it's they're, it's a safe thing to do in this league that, to, to have a political point of view. But maybe more importantly, we both found over the summer increasingly that in our dealings with players, many of them were expressing frustration that they didn't know what to do beyond just speaking out. And our point to these players was that they're incredibly high profile in our society, some of them on a global basis. And many of them were saying to us, all right, I, it's one thing to tweet or to say something after a game, but how can I truly make a difference? And what we were saying to them is this notion that working together, the league and the players association, we have this incredible platform and that whether work, you, you play or working directly with your team or, rep, or working with the league and the players association, that if we combine our resources together and think about things that hands on we can actually do in communities. And one example is last year, we put together a program with all 30 teams where we had forums where players, local kids in the community, young adults, and police officers were holding forums so they could better understand each other. They weren't open to the media, but we found they were very impactful. And that was one way where we were able to say to frustrated players, look what's happening with, with violence in our communities. Police don't understand. Um, young people, young people don't understand the police, that players have this unique ability to bring people together. And so that was really the message, that let's all work together and find ways that you can in a meaningful way, make a difference. Right. We have any audience questions? We have two mics right here. Otherwise, I got plenty more. 
I know there are some reporters in the room. You should get up there. Um, well, I'll, I'll follow up on that just briefly in case anyone needs a second. But obviously not every league is quite as encouraging as you guys are. Um, I'm curious, why, why is that? Like, is, are there certain players in the league that come to you and say, hey, we really need you to take a, a, say this publicly so that others feel comfortable doing that? Is it, did you learn from watching other sports leagues and say we don't want to look like that? Like, what is the reasoning behind it? I, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure, and I, and I really I can't speak to other leagues. Michael has relations with all the other leagues, so maybe he can. I, I would only say maybe we have an advantage in our league that we're a smaller league. At the end of the day, we're, we're 450 players. I, 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 you know, I think the fact that our union happens to be led by superstar players in our league. Chris Paul is the president of our union. Carmelo is on the executive board. LeBron James is on the executive board. My sense is that often, just like in the locker room, other players in the league will follow the top players. I think, you know, I, I put Dwayne Wade in that group that, remember, a year ago or so at the ESPYs, they chose to speak out. And I think maybe you have a group of players who want to have a voice in society. You have a union that, um, in this case, wants to make sure that they know that there are available channels in which they can sort of harness that desire to make a difference. And then you have a league that's saying, you know, that I think has a, a, a history of progressive values and one where I think we feel it's part and parcel with who we are as a league and a, a sense that, again, if we build these relationships with each other, if we work together, we really can have an impact on what's happening around us. I think we have, we'll start with this question up here. Just uh, tell us who you are. Kunal from Set It Out. Michael, you've been one of the pioneers in, in esports, and now I know the NBA is more focused on it as well. How do you think about the licensing opportunity for esports, and is it going to look like traditional sports being very apparel type focused, or is it going to be broader than that in terms of products? I, I think nobody can debate how important esports is coming to just fandom in general. I mean, the numbers are staggering. Adam could talk about it well. I think we all understand it. I think, like any growth industry, there's going to be a big merchandising opportunity there over time. So we certainly think it fits, you know, perfectly for fanatics long term. We think we'll be, um, you know, a really significant player in that business long term. You know, today it's relatively small, but the numbers, if you just look at uh, if you follow the fans, there's going to be big merchandise and opportunities, and we're certainly really excited about it. Yeah, and, and just add to that that, so you know, in the league that we're creating around our NBA 2K game, so these are going to be a different set of athletes competing. I mean, not like the cartridge game that you buy where, in essence, you're playing NBA players. These are real athletes competing in these games. And I think, as, as Michael said, it's, it's become an enormous business. Hundreds of millions of people are following um, eSports globally. And our view is that as these athletes, as these participants become better known, people are going to follow them. What I think is, and, and presumably be interested in what they're wearing. What, what, what I love about it right now, and I've said to Michael, is that there's a lot of tradition around sports in terms of apparel, the kinds of things that are endemic to the league, the kinds of apparel that people associate with these athletes. I think there's a really big opportunity when it comes to esports to reinvent it. I think with any buddy's business here, if you have the opportunity to sort of step back and say, this is a league that's been operating for 70 years, if we had a clean slate and we could start over, you know, how would we dress certain participants, what would we do differently? And that's my sense now with esports. And I can't, you know, whether it's the, the esports hoodie, whatever, that's going to be the big seller, mm -hmm. I have no idea, but I, or, or what, what these participants are going to want to wear, but I know Fanatics, for example, is very focused on it and thinking, all right, what is this new line of products? And maybe, you know, it has much broader appeal because part of in our, our core product, the tank top jersey, there's, you know, certain people just aren't going to wear that or they're not going to wear it out. <laughs> you know, so I think there's, there's a much broader opportunity with the kind of peril people might associate with this league. Great. We'll take one more question in the back. Hi, Ted McCaffrey. Michael, I uh, came from one of your GSI acquisitions, VendorNet, where we sold Omnichannel. And I'm curious to know what you, what is your view of the store of the future? Stores. Sure. So I think my view of the store of the future is, first of all, I'm not one of those people that believes that there's going to be no retail stores in 10 years, but I do think there'll be less retail stores. I mean, the math is pretty simple. You've got to, you know, if you just use America as an example, it's three and a half trillion dollars of merchandise sold today, um, and maybe 15% of that's online. If you look at just the pure math, as online, you know, becomes a much bigger percentage of shares. 
the dollars sold through brick and mortar stores will be less. So certainly a decade from now, I think you're going to see 30% um, less brick and mortar stores. I think you're gonna see a far richer overall experience, much better consumer experience. And I think the retailers that win are gonna have a great omni-channel experience. You've gotta let your consumer buy in whatever channel they want, the way they want, how they want. So certainly I think you'll have less retail, much more technology rich, um, and, and, and I think real differentiation to survive. I don't think, and I'll say this very bluntly, I think if you're a retailer today that sells um, commodity-based merchandise, so you're a retailer selling brands that are commonly available, if, if your strategy is just to kind of win on price, you're eventually gonna die. So I think you need to really differentiate yourself to be successful. It's why we're such a big believer in what we call e-commerce, again, verticalized commerce, because we're building, developing our own kind of direct consumer merchandise. I think that'll be a big part of the future. I think if you look today at what percentage of merchandise that's sold as kind of brands creating their own merchandise directly to consumer, it might be double in a decade from now. So I think three big changes, less retail, um, much more technology-rich, omni-channel focused, and certainly verticalized commerce will be a much bigger percentage of the retail and, dollars. And I'll just add, if you want to see a prototype of the store of the future, <laughs> come to the NBA store, Fifth Avenue and 45th Street. <laughs> I like that. All right, I guess we're gonna, we're gonna end with that. <laughs> Thanks, Michael and Adam. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Recode Editor-in-Chief, Dan Fromer. All right, hey everyone. Uh, our next guest is Mike Vaughn. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Venmo, which is the money transfer